power lines. The source of much awe and intrigue. Who am I kidding? They even look boring. But they didn't start out that way. I for one actually love the power lines. Growing up we had some power lines running right behind our house. These were the big ones, 350,000 volts. Quick tangent, growing up, my dad somehow convinced me that the power lines were evil and they would come alive if I didn't get good grades or something. They'd get me. So I was terrified of the power lines for most of my childhood. Thanks, dad. Looking back, I was rightfully scared of them, but for the wrong reasons. My personal fear of power lines aside, there's a good reason that they're that dangerously high of a voltage. And it's because of a guy that you might have heard of, Nikola Tesla. It's the turn of the 20th century. Thomas Edison was having big problems making his DC electric system work. More on that in a minute. So he hires Tesla, a Serbian immigrant from what is modern day Croatia, and says, Yo, Tesla, I'll pay you mucho money if you make my power generation more efficient. And Tesla says, I. Tesla, being a pretty smart man, finishes his task in only a couple of months and asks to be paid, to which Edison politely responds, You silly foreigners, you don't understand our American sense of humor. <laughs> I'm so funny. <laughs> Starting a long American tradition of cheap foreign labor. Get going. Of course, Tesla reacts like any normal human being would and quits. He then hit the listings and had to dig ditches for a few years to make ends meet. Until he was contacted by Westinghouse Power Company and asked to join. He said yes. Tesla's new design for a power grid was a three-phase AC system, which is what we still use today. That brings us to our question, what makes an AC system so much better than a DC system? And how better to explore the practical advantages than with a practical example? But first, there are two equations you should know. They go something like this. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, voltage equals I times R. Up above the sky so high, power equals V times I. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Huh. Yeah. Moving on. So, I live here, in the city of Houghton, a town you've never heard of. Our power generation is 100 miles away from Fresque Isle in Marquette. Approximately 100 miles of power line separates Houghton and Marquette each way. We can assume a resistance of about 0.2 ohms per mile. Let's say that Presque Isle is using Edison's DC generators. We know that we need to have 120 volts at everybody's house in Houghton, and the entire town demands 100,000 watts. That means that the town draws 833 amps, and we know that that's the same current going through the wires. Using that number, we can calculate the power loss in the lines to be a whopping 27.7 million watts. That is a system that is only 0.36% efficient. But Thomas Edison was a businessman, and he knew a solution. Well, we'll just need to put a very expensive power plant every five miles. It didn't take long for people to see that Edison's plan was whack, but there was no alternative, which set the stage for Tesla and Westinghouse to build an AC power grid which allows for things like long, long distance, distance transmission. transmission. Let's return to our Houghton example, but change a few parameters, like replacing Edison's lame DC generators with Tesla Westinghouse AC generators. The same efficiency problem would exist, but AC power's advantage is that it can use Transformers. Transformers. A transformer relies on AC voltages in order to step up and down the output voltage, and these components are ubiquitous. Indeed, the first thing that power generators do is step up the voltage to, say, 300 kilovolts for transmission. Maybe you're thinking, big deal. Power in is equal to power out. How does that change the power requirements? It doesn't, but watch this. 
The town still needs the 833 amps, but we don't need to push all of that current through the power lines. If we step up the voltage by 2500 times, then we also step down the current by 2500 times to conserve power, which means that the power lines only have to push one third of an amp and only waste about 4.4 watts. That's a system that's 99% efficient. So now using an AC system, power could be transmitted this irregardless of distance. In fact, take a look at this poster that you saw just a minute ago. Wait, zoom in a little, and there. In summary, the AC system works because it can step up the voltage for transmission and back down again for consumer use thanks to AC transformers. With all the advantages of an AC system over a DC system, it didn't take long for the alternating power grid to catch on. Despite Edison's best efforts to vilify the dangers of AC, he never really won a lot of people over. Which is why the power grid now uses the alternating system at- Hey, wait a minute. Why are there three wires on that power line? You may have noticed that the power lines have three or sometimes six wires as opposed to just an outgoing and a return wire. That is because of an innovation for the power grid known as a three-phase system. Three 60Hz sine waves are sent out from the power generator, each 120 degrees out of phase with one another. Once each line goes through the respective loads, like houses, factories, schools, etc., they're tied back together where they add their voltages and cancel each other out. With no need for a return wire, not only can you cut cost, but viola, now there's only half of the line resistance further increasing the efficiency. And that's it. That's the history and the design of our power grid. Simplified to fit in under 10 minutes, of course. Now for some bonus facts. Here's something that people sometimes ask. Why can a bird sit on a power line without being electrocuted? Well, people too can work on the power lines without being electrocuted. The answer is that neither the birds nor the people are completing the circuit. That's not to say that they're not part of the circuit, though just that the current through them is very teeny tiny. Of course, if somebody were to touch the lines and complete a circuit with ground, it would be a very different story. Finally, a bonus fact about the life of Nikola Tesla. People often tout that he was ostracized and never really got the appreciation he deserved. While there is some truth to that, in reality, Tesla was highly regarded by his fellow scientists even while he was alive. As such, I would like to leave you with an excerpt from Tesla's eulogy recorded on January 10th, 1943 by New York's then mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia. On last Thursday night, here in our city of New York, a man who was 87 years of age died in his humble hotel room. His name was Nikola Tesla. He died in poverty, but he was one of the most useful and successful men who ever lived. His achievements were great and are becoming greater as time goes on. Nikola Tesla could have amassed hundreds of millions of dollars, could have become the richest man in the country, in the world, if he wished for riches. He didn't. Now, this extraordinary man is dead, or so they say. But Tesla is not dead. Tesla is not really dead. The real, the important part of Tesla lives in his achievement which is great, almost beyond calculation, an integral part of our civilization.